Welcome to Occult Experiments in the Home, Magic, Spirituality and the Paranormal in Personal Experience and in Practice. What I wanted to do today was to offer some thoughts on telepathy, on the way that telepathy manifests in our everyday experience. If it's real, then it's probably happening all the time. And if that's the case, then perhaps accessing telepathy as a psychic power largely entails developing an awareness of it or changing our perspective. So what I was aiming to do was to start with a definition of telepathy. But of course this runs us smack bang into the usual problem, which is that paranormal ideas, concepts are categorised as paranormal because they're extremely ill-defined and messy. And they're ill-defined and messy because that's their nature. What's more, I also want to look a little bit today at the role of telepathy in magic. As magicians, we've probably all, at one time or another, had some kind of telepathic experience. But I would guess that usually it's the case that to have a telepathic experience might not have been the intention of whatever magical working we were doing at the time, but was something probably that arose as a corollary or a result, an unexpected result perhaps. As counterintuitive as it can sound, I think that bringing magical practice into discussions of paranormal phenomena can offer a useful perspective and cast a certain amount of light. In a non-magical context, paranormal events can seem chaotic, nonsensical, random. But in a magical context, there's always a certain degree of intention, a certain degree of direction. And as I hope will become apparent, sometimes we can use this as a way to calibrate and elucidate a little more clearly what some of the details and processes at work in the experience might be. So, my first attempt at offering a definition of telepathy was going to be something along the lines of a non-verbal non-linguistic communication between two people. But then it struck me that experiences in this vein don't necessarily follow that form. Sometimes we might hear a voice or a word flashes into our mind that proves to give us access to something that was hidden or unknown in the mind of another person. So then I started to think about whether it was more true to say something along the lines of telepathy being a form of communication that we receive in the form of internal imagery rather than external perceptions. But that one didn't last very long either because then I started to think of crisis apparitions, so-called phantasms of the living where someone having the experience might wake up in the night and see someone by their bed, someone they recognise, who may seem to be actually present, perceivable, but then subsequent events reveal that the apparition is a form of communication, telepathic communication, from that person who may have been undergoing some sort of crisis, or more typically was in the process of dying. Sometimes uh, telepathic communication can take the form of something perceived or something that seems to be perceived. And now we discover that somehow we're talking about apparitions, ghosts, because once we admit one form of paranormal phenomena, how do we keep out the rest? Given that in every telepathic experience there comes a moment where we realise that the message we've received is something in the mind of another, how do we know that this is telepathy and not actually precognition of that moment of understanding? 
everything's a mess in these realms. Everything's all over the place. But I think we just have to embrace this. It's, it's the nature of the territory. Luckily, however, whilst I was in the midst of all these thoughts, I stumbled across some notes I'd made on an article by Nick Totten. He's a very senior psychotherapist and one of the few people in this field brave enough to take the paranormal very seriously and write seriously about it and its relationship to the discipline of psychotherapy. Here's what Totten says. Telepathy, he writes, like other paranormal events, is defined as such not by the mechanism, but by the quality of the experience. What is essentially telepathic interaction can take place through any other known or unknown channel. What then identifies telepathic communication? Not the mode of operation, but its result. The unfamiliar, uncanny experience of transparency between subjects. This passage offers us a way to cut through the bizarre and confusing range of experiences that we might describe as telepathic. What Totten does there is steer us away from seeking to define telepathy as a specific kind of mechanism or process, which of course we can't do but to identify it more in terms of its experiential impact. The unfamiliar, uncanny experience of transparency between subjects. That cinches it, I think. The telepathic experience is something that we're not used to. Suddenly another mind is visible to us. Or perhaps it's we ourselves that suddenly find ourselves apparently visible to somebody else in a way that we're not used to, in a way that feels as if it's not supposed to happen. And I love the way that Totten describes it also as simply between subjects, which on the one hand leaves it open to the fact that more than two people might be involved, but also, as will become relevant when we look at the magical implications of telepathy, that the parties may not all be human. Because in a magical context, if we're considering communication with deities or other discarnate entities, then the supposed means of communication is probably more likely to be telepathy than it is anything else. As ever, in thinking and presenting examples of telepathic experiences. I'm going to be drawing on ideas from magical practice and also from the practice of therapy. It might be said that the two of them stand in a curiously similar relationship to telepathy. Neither of them set out consciously to bring about telepathic experiences, but I think in the case of both of them telepathy often tends to creep in. In the case of magic, suppose you wanted to know what was going on in somebody else's mind and you didn't have the opportunity just to ask them. In that case, I think the approach we're most likely to take, rather than a working to do some sort of Vulcan mind meld with the person concerned, you would probably do a divination. As I mentioned previously, telepathic experiences in magical practice tend to creep in as corollaries or side effects or sometimes as results, possibly unexpected results. But in the context of magic, well, we tend to accept them. We will accept them as a result and run with it. This is very far from the case in therapy and counselling. Talk to therapists and a pretty high percentage of them, I would say, will have interesting stories to tell about how telepathy seems to creep into the therapy room. 
sometimes when this happens it can be really bizarre and striking and sometimes it seems odd and a bit trivial and sometimes when it happens it could be therapeutically useful to bring it into focus it might seem to demonstrate a uh, emerging an intimacy between the mind of the therapist and the client and it might be therapeutically useful to draw attention to that but that would depend of course on the kind of relationship that was there between the therapist and the client and what was going on in the therapy at the time and what this can mean in practice is that sometimes striking telepathic experiences might be experienced by one side or both but they may end up not being talked about at all either because the relationship between the therapist and the client isn't the sort of relationship that could process talking about something like that or because it's not therapeutically useful to do so and could even conceivably be re-traumatising in some way. To give an example from personal experience, I'd been in psychoanalytic psychotherapy for a number of years with a very experienced therapist and I can't remember the details of what we were talking about at the time but this was pretty old school therapy and I was lying on a couch and she was seated a, a short distance behind me and <laughs> silence had fallen upon the room and I found myself daydreaming and I was imagining going to the opera now I'd never been to the opera before never had any particular interest in opera but at that time it was looking as if I'd soon have the opportunity to do that and so there I was daydreaming about what it might feel like to be putting on a dinner jacket and a bow tie and mingling with the great and good at the opera house and just then suddenly my therapist picked up the conversation again she picked up something I'd said previously and asked a question, something like how would what you were saying play out when you're out in public? Suppose you were out shopping or at the opera. It's probably difficult to convey how bizarre and striking it was when she said that and why she'd happened to choose the opera is one of her examples of being out in public because I'd not told her that there was a possibility of me going to the opera and as I said it was something I'd not really had any interest in thinking of it from a therapist's point of view you wouldn't furnish your comments with examples or illustrations from aspects of life that you knew weren't relevant to your client at the time I was seeing her, I was working part-time, I was a student, and she was seeing me for a reduced fee. So it felt really odd that she would pluck an example from the air that related to the opera. Now, although I could have brought this to her attention, I decided not to. During that particular therapy, although it went on for quite a few years, there was often quite a lot of friction between the two of us. I won't go into the details here, but just to say that the usefulness of that therapy for me lay mostly in me being confronted with and working through what was often a very negative reaction to my poor therapist. Another feature of our relationship was how she would often react in a dismissive reductive hostile way if ever I decided to talk about anything to do with magic or mysticism or the paranormal it really seemed to trigger and irritate her for some reason although we talked about this quite a lot it was a breach that the two of us never really found a way of getting over or around and I think that moment 
that bizarre striking moment where it felt as if she had picked up on my daydream was a kind of unwanted reminder to me that no matter how much I was perhaps fighting to keep my distance from her, nevertheless at some level we were intimately conjoined. I was transparent to her in that moment, it felt. But at the same time, I didn't talk about it because I felt strongly that if I did, she would just dismiss or reject or pathologise the experience as she so often had when I'd raised similar things in the past. I just knew instinctively that if I brought it to her attention, it wasn't going to go well. Therapy's a profession. You have to train and be educated to do it. You are paid money to do it. It is assumed that there is evidence and some kind of scientific basis for what goes on in the therapy room. Consequently, therapists and the therapeutic institutions as a whole tend to take a very dim view of paranormal ideas. And yet, at the same time, the therapeutic relationship seems to be a hotbed for producing precisely the kinds of experiences that might be described as paranormal. As I hope my example illustrates, the therapeutic relationship can be very intense, very intimate. You've got one person talking openly about the very personal details of their life and another person listening intently and often not saying very much about themselves at all. At the same time, the therapeutic relationship is incredibly boundaried. You meet at the same time each week for a certain amount of time. You never see each other outside the therapy room all those times. And in the example I gave, I was using a couch. So despite the types of things that were being talked about, deep, personal, intimate things, there wasn't even any eye-to-eye contact. In therapy, sometimes it can feel like you're creating these insanely paradoxical conditions that encourage intimacy and separation at one and the same time. And there are good, solid reasons why it's like that, which are focused, first and foremost, on hopefully being helpful to the client. But at the same time, is it any wonder if anomalous experiences, particularly experiences that we might describe as telepathic, insist on creeping into the therapy room, no matter how strongly the therapeutic organisations might want to keep them out. I met somebody at a social gathering once, and she was training to be a therapist, and she talked about the tremendous difficulties she had had finding a training placement. She had been turned away by numerous practices that she had applied to as soon as she had revealed to them that she would worked previously as a psychic medium. She wasn't trying to hide this in her applications, she was upfront about it. But several organisations that she would approached, as soon as they heard that they turned her down point blank. The circumstances, the conditions of therapy, I think, create incredibly fertile conditions for apparently telepathic experiences to take place. Yet the profession as a whole really doesn't welcome this. And it remains a really under-researched area. The psychoanalyst and cultural critic Makita Brotman offers the following take on this in her book, Phantoms of the Clinic. Studies confirm, she writes, that for therapists to be maximally effective, they must believe in themselves, in the value of their services, in the truth of their educations, and in the power of their particular methods. As a result, most therapists, even transpersonal ones, will claim that their understanding of a patient is based on clinical intuition or wide experience rather than a strong capacity for guesswork, feeling, sensitivity or, worst of all, telepathy. Without such distinguishing criteria, how would we know the therapist from the table turner? 
And I found myself traversing similar lines of thought in my conversation with the woman at the social gathering. Working as a psychic medium, it struck me that she perhaps had precisely the sort of skills that would be useful in working as a therapist. A deep sensitivity and an ability to read another person's feelings, thoughts. The dominant assumption seems to be that mediums are by definition always fraudulent in some sense. But also that therapists, because they have a recognised qualification, that means they're always somehow legitimate in their approach. Personally, I don't think it's as simple as that on either side. Mikita Brotman's book is a very interesting one. What she does is to present a history of the relationship between psychoanalysis and the paranormal. A very intriguing but uneasy relationship as it happens. And Brotman argues that despite the controversy and struggle over the notion of telepathy within psychoanalysis, what perhaps has happened is that the notion of telepathy has become, these days, ensconced within it, kind of smuggled in, in a way, through a specific concept which is now widely accepted among therapists of a psychoanalytic orientation, the idea of projective identification. And it's this that I want to explore in some detail with some examples, because I think it's a useful concept that helps us situate what I was talking about earlier, the notion that telepathy is something that we perhaps experience quite frequently in our everyday lives. I imagine a lot of people listening to this are already fairly familiar with the idea of psychological projection. It's a term very frequently used to describe those situations in which we find ourselves attributing thoughts, ideas, behaviours, feelings to somebody other when those thoughts, behaviours, feelings, whatever, are actually our own. They don't belong to the other person at all. The upshot of that is we end up relating to a fantasy version of who that person actually is. In projective identification, although the term is understood in different ways by different people, what generally is the sense there is that those projections of ours somehow land. Somehow what gets projected sticks and has an impact on the other person and they may actually end up feeling, behaving precisely in ways that aren't theirs as such but are being attributed to them. There's a really common example of this and it's not just therapists who come up against this but I imagine anybody who works in services of any kind dealing with people and it also comes up in personal relationships too. I'm thinking of that situation where somebody comes to us for help but then in all sorts of different ways they proceed to make it very difficult for us to help them. Whatever we suggest to them they dismiss as being of no use or they might come to us for help and then proceed to explain exactly why we're unable to help them because we don't understand, because we don't have the right knowledge or because there is nothing that can help although we might be able to see at the same time that that's clearly not the case. What can often happen to us in that situation is we might start to feel panicky, worried, concerned, anxious. We might start to question ourselves, notice ourselves not feeling good enough, not feeling capable of dealing with this situation. And there it is, that can be projective identification at work. That sense of helplessness that we can sometimes feel in that situation isn't actually ours. We might be as capable of helping as anybody else. But what sometimes can happen is that the person in need of help has managed to communicate, probably completely unconsciously, and in a very powerful and direct way, what are actually their feelings of helplessness. If we can succeed in 
noticing this rather than being completely triggered by it, then, oddly, strangely, it becomes transformed into a really direct experience of what the other person is experiencing. And it's in this sense that projective identification might be understood as a form of telepathy. But hang on a minute, how is this taking place? In the example I've given, is that really appropriately described as telepathy, as something paranormal? And of course, this is where things can get blurry. Sometimes it may indeed be words, body language, social cues that are the means by which somebody else's feelings become experienced as our own. Maybe it's in relationships that are more intimate where we start to come across examples where it's much harder to state how something in somebody else's mind seems to come into ours. I remember a particularly vivid example of this once in a conversation with a girlfriend and she was trying to tell me about a person who she'd heard on the radio or seen on TV but she couldn't remember their name and she was trying to reach for that name and to reach for some associations with that person. But I remember at the time there was just something in the tone of her voice and with no other information whatsoever I was able to say the name immediately with 100% certainty that that was who she meant. Her emotional reaction to this person, because I knew her so intimately, apparently seemed to transfer directly into my mind. And in these sorts of cases, much, much harder, I think, to give an account of the means by which that communication takes place, apart from what Totten describes so beautifully in his definition of telepathy, the transparency between subjects. The concept of projective identification originally comes from Melanie Klein. She used it to describe a very primitive defence mechanism in which an infant projects what it feels are bad parts of itself into the mother so that it starts to seem to the infant that the mother isn't a separate individual anymore but is those bad parts of the self. What Klein originally described as projective identification was really just a special case of projection. The concept started to shift after it fell into the hands of the psychoanalyst Wilfred Bion. We talked about Wilfred Bion in episode 3 of season 2. Some of his ideas I think are really useful for conceptualising aspects of paranormal experience and aspects of magical practice as well. In Beyond's hands, there's a sense of projective identification as being something fundamental in the way the mind works, fundamental in the sorts of things that the mind does. Beyond suggests that we go around all the time putting things from our minds into the minds of others, because that, in a sense, is what minds are for. If we think back to our earlier example, of the person seeking help who ends up instilling a sense of helplessness in the people that they approach. At first this seems a bizarre, counterproductive thing to do. But when we break it down, there is a kind of logic to it. And for Beyond, projective identification was indeed very much a primitive form of thinking. So if someone comes to us for help and then proceeds to make it impossible for us to help them. What they may be deflecting attention away from there is their dependency. If it were possible for someone to help, then they would be dependent upon that person. And dependency can be a very scary thing to admit. It could be a overwhelming, paralyzing thing to have to admit to ourselves. Now, contrary to appearances, humans are social animals. We tend not to do too well unless we're part of a group and feeling that everyone in the group is on the same page. So if I'm in distress, it's doing me no good at all to be looking around and seeing everybody else being fine. I'm distressed and I can't see a way out of that distress. But maybe if I can 
put some of that distress into other people and get them distressed as well, then we'll all be on the same page and maybe at some point someone will be able to do something. When a rabbit sees a threat and decides to run, you see the white flash of its tail as it runs away. And that white flash is a signal of danger to all the other rabbits that might be in the vicinity. Beyond's take on protective identification is maybe almost a mental equivalent of the flash of the rabbit's tail. It's a primitive, fundamental survival mechanism. Our minds go around putting bits of themselves into other people's minds. Bits that we find too scary, too overwhelming to deal with in any other way. Except to try and spread them around a bit in the hope that then at least we'll all be on the same page. We'll all be sharing the burden of that same distress, perhaps. And could it be that this was what was happening to some degree in the personal example I gave of my fantasies about the opera? There was an element of social anxiety in that. And could it be that that was what my therapist unconsciously picked up on and was sharing with me, unbeknownst to her? Between, on the one hand, Melanie Klein's idea of projective identification, which is basically just a species of projection, in other words, fantasy, and, on the other hand, Beyond's notion of projective identification as a fundamental part of the mind's workings, and that it does indeed entail bits of minds being put into other minds. Between these two, a lot of analysts and thinkers tend to try to tread a middle path. Most take the view that it's not some sort of hardwired process, but things like body language and social cues. But on the other hand, I do think that taking this middle path sidesteps the question of how the communication takes place. My opera daydream and even the example of the conversation with my girlfriend. There's no perceivable means by which that transference of meaning happened. And personally, I don't find it satisfactory just to conclude, well, in any case, there had to have been one and I just missed it. If... Beyond's ideas have some of the weight of reality on their side, then presumably it's the case that in every instance of projective identification, in every apparently telepathic experience, there is anxiety, a sense of something overwhelming or unbearable in play. Even in the example of the conversation with my girlfriend, the name that she was trying to remember was of somebody who she seriously had a disliking for. And my furnishing a name perhaps provided her with a sense of relief in that she didn't need to hold that person in mind in the same way any longer. Another example comes to mind, and here I think we start to edge away into cases of uh, an ostensibly more paranormal kind. In 2007, I was sitting meditating one evening at about six o'clock, and I suddenly seemed to hear a woman's voice exclaiming in quite a frightened way, I'm done, I'm done. And this was so vivid and sudden, it jolted me out of the meditation. I opened my eyes and looked around. I didn't expect to see anybody because it seemed quite clear that the voice was internal, but there was a strong sense that somebody had died. Now, there was an elderly female relative of my partner who was ill at the time, but thankfully nothing happened to her over the days that followed. And also at that time there was a senior manager at the place where I worked who was terminally ill. And sadly, the very next day when I went into work, I found out that he'd passed away. And I supposed to myself that that was maybe what that experience was all about. But it never quite satisfied me because the voice I'd heard was definitely female and the person who'd passed away was male. Two weeks later, I opened a letter that had been delivered to the building where I lived and had laying in the hall for quite a few days, addressed to someone whose name I didn't recognise. There was no return address on the envelope, so I figured that I'd 
open it and return it to the sender. And this was how I discovered that one of my neighbours who lived directly below me, who was an elderly woman, she'd passed away in hospital. And the letter was a letter of condolence that had been sent to the sister of my neighbour who died. It had been sent to my neighbour's address, but addressed to the sister, and that was why I didn't recognise the name. The letter of condolence was dated five days after I'd heard the voice, and I wondered if this could be my personal experience of a crisis apparition, because it seemed quite likely that my neighbour could have died on or around the time I heard the voice. And I had had some contact with her. I knew she was ill. I knew she was in hospital. And I'd offered to keep an eye on her because she lived alone and I knew she was concerned about being taken ill. But a few years went by and the circumstances of this experience nagged at me because, of course, I couldn't be sure that I heard the voice around the time she died. For all I knew, the two events hadn't coincided at all. So eventually I decided to obtain a copy of my neighbour's death certificate to see if that would shed any further light. And what I discovered from that was actually she'd passed away three days after I'd heard the voice. In which case it would seem that the experience of the voice didn't have anything to do with her passing away at all. However, there's not very much information given on a death certificate. But one of the things that was mentioned was that my neighbour had suffered a heart attack three days before she finally and sadly passed away. And lo and behold, the date given of the heart attack was indeed the very same day on which I'd heard the voice. As to the exact time of day she had the heart attack, well, it didn't seem appropriate for me to probe any further than I had already. But one possibility here is that although the experience of the voice had definitely not coincided with the moment of my neighbour's death, it might possibly have coincided with the moment at which she may have lost consciousness. And at that time, of course, she was undergoing the experience of a cardiac arrest. If that were the case, and if this were some kind of telepathic communication, could it be that what was happening was the transmission of some tiny part of that traumatic experience into me, in a much reduced form, of course, but powerful enough to jolt me out of my meditation? And had it required me to be in a quiescent meditative state in order to receive that transmission? We're at a loss, of course, if we want to somehow confirm any of this. But returning to Totten's notion of telepathy as transparency between subjects and Beyond's particular version of projective identification, could it be the case that there is a traumatic dimension to telepathic experiences? That they necessarily take the form of some kind of transaction of anxiety a blind, unconscious groping for relief from something overwhelming by transferring it desperately to somebody else. Personally, I don't think it's as simple or as one-sided as that. And my reason for supposing that is, although perhaps it's possible for us to have experiences where feelings, intense, difficult feelings that aren't ours get put into us by other people. Nevertheless, it's possible to recognise that happening. And sometimes we may not even need to recognise it happening in order to respond to it in ways that make the other person feel better and to some extent resolve those feelings. Maybe it's the case that as often as not a telepathic transaction is successful in the sense that it reduces or alleviates anxiety and in that way actually increases intimacy and contact. It did that in that little example of the conversation with my girlfriend. It was maybe 
on its way to doing that in the example of me and my therapist. Despite the friction between us, it was consoling to know that on an unconscious level at least, she was there, she was aware of what was going on inside of me. And maybe the most common examples of telepathic experiences of all are those where we find ourselves so intimate with people that we can finish their sentences for them, that we know, we just know exactly what's going on for them at any given moment. Telepathic experiences, if we look at them from the perspective that the concept of projective identification offers us, they can be in the service of trauma, but also equally in the service of intimacy. And this, I think, leads us into consideration of experiences that might be described as telepathic, but relate more exclusively to the arena of magical practice. I'm thinking about communications, interactions with deity, with gods and goddesses and perhaps other kinds of discarnate beings. These generally don't have a physical body or a vocal apparatus to hand, so they're not able to communicate with us through linguistic or bodily means. By definition, any contact that we're going to have with these entities is telepathic by nature. When, back in 2006, I was doing the working known in the Western esoteric tradition as the knowledge and communication of the Holy Guardian Angel, I'd done some preliminary work and established that my Holy Guardian Angel, or HGA, was associated with the colour blue, was bird-like and very wise. It had also given me its name, which began with the letter G. So as a next step, I requested my HGA to confirm its identity by appearing to me in a dream. That night, I was at my girlfriend's, and a slightly strange thing happened just before I fell asleep. I noticed a rhythm, a beat, repeating over and over in my mind. It was like two long beats followed by a short beat, kind of da da dit, da da dit. Very odd. I probably would have forgotten all about it if it weren't for the fact that I was snuggled up with my girlfriend at the time. And I hadn't mentioned this at all, but suddenly she, seemingly half asleep, started tapping out the same rhythm on my arm as it was going through my mind, which was really, really quite bizarre. But anyway, I decided not to wake her up and we both fell asleep. And that night, disappointingly, I had no remarkable dreams at all. Nothing that seemed to have any relevance to my HGA. But that next morning, I noticed my girlfriend was writing down her dream in her notebook. And finally the penny dropped, and I asked her, what, what did you dream last night? She told me she'd found herself in a magical room full of strange objects, and inside this room, a guardian was sitting at a desk. And in the dream, he handed her a statue, which was blue, of an old, wise-looking man holding a staff. And he'd said to her, do you know who this is? And she'd made a guess, which was something that turned out to be significant personally for her. But finally she admitted she didn't know, and the guardian behind the desk had just smiled at her, and she realised in that moment that it didn't matter about giving a correct answer. The, the guardian was just trying to get her to think. But of course, this was extraordinarily significant for me. The colour blue, the statue of the wise old man. And the final clincher came when I looked up what that da-da-dit might mean in terms of Morse code. Dash, dash, dot. Which turned out to be G, the first letter of my HGA's name. This was one of the most bizarre and striking experiences I'd ever had. And it's not unique among people doing the knowledge and communication of the Holy Guardian Angel. I've had magical colleagues report experiences every bit as mind-blowing. 
What I consider mind-blowing about it is the way that this apparently discarnate entity confirmed its nature, its identity, not through me having some kind of experience, which of course might always be open to influence by suggestion, but through an experience coming to me via the mind of another person, seeming to prove that whatever this thing was, it could act on a transpersonal level of experience. One of the problems with apparently telepathic experiences is they can often share a lot of features with paranoid thinking or paranoid delusions. When we're considering claims of telepathy, we have to be on the lookout for that. But this experience didn't seem to share those characteristics. In paranoid thinking, there's a sense of struggle, adversity, of things that need to be safeguarded against, things that need to be brought under control. Paranoid thinking perhaps maybe shares more characteristics with what we were talking about earlier telepathy in its traumatic mode rather than its intimate mode and it was that intimate mode that was in play here I think because that experience felt like connection with the mind of some sort of entity that beyond all doubt now I could experience as genuine as true as authentic and I felt seen by it and I felt that it was close at hand and all my doubts and anxieties and sense of struggle with regard to it were, through that communication, resolved and eased and sorted. In magical practice, when we're communicating with deity discarnate beings, I think this is something that we should be on the lookout for. We recognise the positive nature of these beings as evidenced by forms of telepathy in that intimate mode rather than in the traumatic or the paranoid mode. Perhaps it's the case that standard verbal communication stands in relation to telepathic communication in the same way that speaking to somebody stands in relation to touching somebody. It's almost as if in telepathic communication we are, in a sense, touching the other and at the same time they're touching us. You can't have one without the other when you touch somebody. Both parties in that moment are touched. And when we reach out to touch somebody, maybe there are only a couple of options there. We touch somebody in order to establish intimacy or to be intimate with them or we touch them in order to struggle with them to restrain them or impel them or strike them using that simple and elegant description of telepathy as transparency between subjects and combining that with the concept of projective identification it perhaps enables us to see how telepathic communication is something happening all the time it can appear in a wide range of different experiences and perhaps they sit on a continuum. Sometimes the communication is happening through body language or social cues and we don't have to think of it as paranormal at all. But perhaps that does shade off into a paranormal direction when we can find no trace of any conventional medium by which that communication took place. And I think it also shades off as well into an explicitly magical realm when we're receiving communications from entities, from subjects that by definition can't have any conventional means of making contact with us. Nick Totten himself, by the way, reaches the following conclusion. I suggest, he says, that the paranormal is aligned with what Lacan calls the real, and the real is bodily. Totten tends towards this idea that what we consider the paranormal is the impact upon us of something beyond conception, something that the mind, that mental processing can't really get to grips with. 
a kind of reality in a raw state that human beings can't really process. And his suggestion that this may reside in the body to some extent perhaps doesn't position him too far outside the mainstream. There is an implication in that that the paranormal could still be anchored in the physical in some way. My cheeky rejoinder to Totten's suggestion that the paranormal is bodily would be to say, well, which body do you mean? In many occult traditions, of course, there are notions, ideas, that the human being has more than one body besides the physical. There are the so-called etheric, astral and mental bodies, of course, for instance. And could it be that the range of different experiences of telepathic communication that we've looked at in this episode, could it be that those differences are a consequence of different bodies coming into play in different ways? Well, (laughs) I seem to have got to where I wanted to get to, so that's it for this episode. Take care, look after yourself, and remember that you don't have to rely on telepathy now in order to get in touch. It's possible to support the podcast now and access additional material on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash oeith if you'd like to see more details. All right, until next time, bye-bye.